tonight we're here to celebrate publication of the wonderful Blue Book of Nebo by Manon Stefan Ross. And I'd just like, before we go too much further, I'll just tell you the shape of this evening's event. Um, we're going to hear firstly from Penny Thomas, publisher at Firefly Press. Then my colleague Bev Humphrey is going to be talking to Manon about the book. And we hope Manon will give us a short reading. And then towards the end of the evening, we'll open up questions uh, to, from you. So get your thinking caps on and do pop them in the chat box. Um, and we will we'll answer as many of those as possible as we go along. Um, as always, signed book plated copies can be purchased via H&H &H Spalding Books. Um, we'll pop that link in the chat box in a moment or two. They're, they're very good. They're offering the book at a special price of £7.99 for single copies or £7 for orders of six or more. And that's inclusive of postage and packing. But back to business. Manon Stefan Ross is an acclaimed Welsh language author of books for adults as well as for children. Um, she's written, I think, over 40 books in total and has previously won the Wales the Wales Book of the Year for her adult fiction. She's also won Eisteddfod and National Theatre Wales Awards for her script writing. But tonight is about publication of the wonderful The Blue Book of Nebo, first published in Welsh. And I apologise for the mangling of the Welsh language as Licha Glas Nebo. I'm sorry. I adored this book and I guarantee that it will linger in your mind long after you've finished it. But you don't just need to take my word for it, that it's a fabulous book. Um, in, its, in its Welsh language edition, it won the Triple Crown Book Prizes at the 2019 Welsh Book of the Year Awards. And amongst the very many glowing reviews of the book, I love this one um, from, from Hugh Reese. I hope he's not a relative of your panel, um, but he says, Goodreads tells me that I've currently read and reviewed some 650 or so books since I first started posting reviews on this site just over a decade ago. This book, By a Country Mile, is the best of all those books. I read this before the COVID crisis started. It was brilliant and relevant then. It's even more so now. It's a novel of hope. It's a novel which celebrates the human condition. It's possibly the most uplifting novel I've ever read as a human being. And it's certainly the novel that's made me think most about what it is to be human. If you do nothing else, try and find a way to consume this wonderful and brilliant piece of work. Isn't that lovely? So just before we hear from Manon, um, I'd like to introduce Penny Thomas from Firefly, who's going to say a few words about publishing the book. So over to you, Penny. You're Okay, um, thank you very much, Naomi. Um, oh, that was terrific. I think you're just, just as close to, I won't say the title again as I could be. So, <laughs> um, so great, yes. So thank you to Authors Aloud for hosting this. Um, just very briefly, um, Firefly um, is a children's and YA publisher based in Wales. Um, we've been going since 2013. Um, this, um, I just feel incredibly lucky that um, we were able to um, sign um, the Blue Book of Nebo um, as soon as I heard that it was available in English, um, I did everything I possibly could to get hold of it and with a little bit of help from the Books Council of Wales and with so much thanks to Manon for um, agreeing to publish with us. Um, uh, we, it all happened pretty quickly actually. Um, we would have got it out before Christmas if we could have, there just wasn't time. Um, so um, we've gone for a, you know, a brand new year's start. Um, I'd heard a lot about it in the Welsh language I and mean, um, colleagues of mine were at the Wales Book of the Year event when it swept the board in Welsh. Um, so obviously very interested to read it. And um, as, as everybody else, I mean, I can't better the review you've just read out, but we, we were completely blown away. Um, it's a beautiful book. Um, it's it's uh, to be so delicate and so hard hitting at the same time um, and so peaceful um, in, in the face of a global apocalypse. Um, it's just, um, you know, it, it's just wonderful writing. It's wonderful writing in English and I, and I wish I could read it in the Welsh. Um, so I hope you enjoy it. It's um, it's slightly unusual, I think, for um, a young adult books, which have become a little, same is the wrong word, but there, there is a sort of, there are several types of YA books. I think this will just break all those barriers, um, but also be really very much loved. So yeah, we're delighted to bring this to um, the English language readership. 
Thank you. That's lovely. Thank you, Penny. That's great. Right. Um, over to the main event, which, sorry, Bev, isn't you, but uh, is Manon. But <laughs> I will leave Bev and Manon <laughs> to chat now. Yes, I'm, I'm very glad that you said that. I certainly wouldn't want to be the main event. Um, I'm already feeling a little bit nervous at stepping into Annie's shoes this evening. Uh, so, um, yes, I am definitely not the main event, but I am so excited about talking to Manon tonight. I have also read the book, read it at the weekend, in one greedy gulp, I would say, as well, because just couldn't bear to put it down at all. And... I loved it so much and there's so much love for the book coming in the chat box that that's what's made me a little bit nervous tonight because I really enjoyed it so much. Um, so welcome Manon. If we can start with um, perhaps you could tell us a little bit about your background and how you first came to get into writing. Oh yeah well thank you at first just I could do this every night just to listen to people saying really nice things about my books should we do the same tomorrow night same time same place no thank you thank you very much and for everyone for um logging on tonight it's really lovely that so many people have come so yeah I was um born and raised in uh, Gwynedd in a little village called Hulas and I just I've always loved reading um I, I really it, it's been kind of my best friend really throughout my life um just that ability to go somewhere else and explore the things that are in your mind that you're not quite sure how to face in the real world you can face them in a book um that's been written by somebody else or in a story that you create yourself so I think that's really how I came um to writing is that um, my first novel was a, a novel for older, yeah, older children. It's a fantasy novel. And I wrote it um, after I lost my mother. Uh, and I was pregnant with my first child a couple of years after mum died. And I kept obsessing about the way that my children would see my mother. They would see her as a kind of two-dimensional person in a, in a photo frame in my home. And I hated that, that they wouldn't really get to know her as the kind of vivacious, funny, uh, wonderful woman she was. So I decided that the best way I knew to get through that was to write a novel with my mum as a character in the novel. So uh, Truir Darlin and Truir Tonna are my first two novels. Uh, Shan is a character in those novels and she's my mum. She's 14 in the novels and she's kind of feisty and cool and all of those things so it really it was a way of dealing with trauma I suppose and then with every book that's come since then it's always about me kind of trying to understand something of the world or something of myself wow that <laughs> yeah. very powerful. that's really interesting okay so let's come to to this book what what if you could tell those in the audience that haven't been lucky enough to read it yet what it's about and where you got the idea from for it okay so basically it's a, a post apocalyptic novel about um a mother and son who live uh in a very rural area of north wales um a, a tiny village called nepo and they live outside nepo mm -hmm. um and something happens and we don't quite know what happens, but there's some kind of nuclear disaster we think may be connected um, with the Wilva nuclear power plant in Anglesey. Um, and the electricity all switches off um, and society basically crumbles until it's just those two on their own. Um, when I was a child, my parents really, they were activists I suppose I don't think they'd term themselves <laughs> in that way but um, every weekend was uh, protesting somewhere it was either with the Welsh language society uh, but occasionally we would go to CND matches the campaign for nuclear disarmament and I was quite an anxious child mm -hmm. and I remember being really properly scared of um any sort of nuclear disaster it was you know I'd have recurring nightmares about it and and as I grew up and became a teenager I started worrying about other things and then I had my own children and I just 
matured, I think. And I returned to that same kind of worry, that same kind of anxiety about that. And I think that's where it came from. I think it was the the, the thing that I feared most. Um, I had to write it down and explore it in my mind. And it was not just the nuclear apocalypse, but I've kind of married that with my other great fear, which is what will happen when my children grow up and leave me. <laughs> and so those both, both those things are kind of married in this novel, I think. They never leave you, Manon. Oh, thank me. you for saying that. <laughs> they never leave you. Um, <laughs> They, they just become more demanding, I think. Okay. I am <laughs> seeing the eldest is 16 now and I'm kind of seeing. <laughs> yeah. Well, you get a little phase then where they start to pull away and then they all come back as soon as they want something. It's, it's Good. not Thank a you. problem. Um, but so where, where you were saying that you were very affected by the idea of nuclear war, I mean, and that was heightened, I suppose, with your children. And I think that's a very true thing to say because you're not frightened for yourself so much you get frightened for your children don't you well I don't know if it's specifically my children but I think as you get older you think about the the world that you're going to leave to the next generation so I don't think it's something sort of exclusive to parenthood Mm. and I almost think that I I can't personalize it that much that I'm specifically thinking about my own kids but I'm just does constantly worry me, especially um, with the cl- climate crisis now. Um, what kind of world will will we be living in? And I think writing for me is just the way to face those kinds of fears. It's a great way of um, expressing yourself and getting your thoughts out, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I could never do it as beautifully as you do, Madam, but oh, I can quite you. see how you know Catholic that would be. So um, could we start off, if possible, with you reading us a, a short excerpt from the book oh, so that others can get a flavour? That will be lovely. OK, um, I'm going to start. I'm just going to read a part from the beginning because um, I can't find a part from the middle that isn't a complete spoiler (laughs) so it's just easier to go from the top um dylan mam says that it's best to write like this now because she can't be bothered to teach me i think can't be bothered or can't find the energy i'm not sure which it is or if there's any difference she used to sit with me for an hour each morning the hour when mona sleeps We did stuff like adding and reading, not like we used to do at school, no graphs or times tables or anything like that. She got me to read books and then I had to write about them and she marked them with a red biro, telling me where I'd spelled something wrong or said something stupid. And then after doing adding up and taking away, there was no more maths. She started to worry. About the biros too, because we don't want them running out. I don't have anything else to teach you, Dylan, she said yesterday. She just read through something I'd written about a romantic novel about a man and a woman who meet on a train, and I think something clicked in her. There's no point carrying on like this. So she said that as long as I spend an hour writing every day, she wasn't going to bother me with schoolwork anymore. She got this book from a house we broke into in Nepo. It was in one of the small drawers of a little desk in the corner of someone's living room. Usually we only steal the really important stuff, like matches or rat poison or books. But she held this notebook in her hands and turned it over a few times before putting it in her bag. You have that, she said later when we got home, to write your story. The blue book of Nepo, I smiled, taking the book from her. The pages were blank and wide, like a new day. Eh? asked Mam. Like the black book of Carmarthen or the red book of Hergest. That's how they did it in the olden days. I'd read about them in a book about Welsh history. Important books that said something about our history, and now is a part of history, isn't it? The book's jacket is a lovely, rich, dark blue, almost black. Bible black, Dylan Thomas said. 
but you can tell when a book is a Bible without even looking at the spine for the title. You just know. My book doesn't look like an important book, but all books are just words strung together. Well, can we just quit with the questions and we'll just <laughs> read for the whole evening? I'm sure nobody would complain. It's just so lovely. <laughs> so, um, the book naturally is written in alternating chapters between mother and son. Um, mm -hmm. Why did you decide to write it in that way? And is that quite difficult to move from the two different viewpoints? Um, I, I didn't decide. Um, I never plan anything that I'm writing at all. I've tried before and it just doesn't work for me. I get bored. Um, it's just how it came out. And I didn't really notice that I was doing it until sort of quite quite a long time after I'd finished um, writing the book. Uh, so yeah, I, I felt, I suppose that we needed to hear both voices, yeah. but also to, kind of explore this idea of that there is no one truth because we don't know um, how their shared experiences feel different to each of them. And I wanted to kind of think a, a, a bit about that and, and how that felt. So when you're writing, Manon, do you write longhand or do you write on a computer? I tend to start off longhand and then sort of uh, when I... When I um, when I'm kind of breezing through it, I, I kind of write it up on a computer, but I, I, I write really, really quickly, mm. but it's in my head for quite a long time. But I think this one has been brewing for many, 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 many years, but I think it took about maybe three weeks to write. Three weeks? Yeah, I, but but it's, wow. I think I've kind of worked it out before, <laughs> before yeah. I've started writing without even sort of being conscious of it. So I, I spend a lot of my time panicking that I'm not making deadlines and then I kind of... <laughs> <laughs> so in other words, to... you work best under pressure. Yes, yes. <laughs> I wish I was just, I, I wasn't so heavily reliant on procrastination, but it kind of helps in a way as well. I think yeah. everything feeds it. Yeah, I can see that point. Um, I'm just happy to hear you say that you start writing in longhand because this is going to sound a bit strange, but it's... It's a book that deserves to be written in longhand, you know, because the the prose is just so beautiful. Oh, thank you. That um, words on a screen can tend to feel a little bit soulless. So I love the thought of you writing it down first. That's that's made me very happy. I, I'm a nerd with um, paper and pens and that kind of thing. It has to be the right one. And I have to sort of, sometimes I start writing something and I'm thinking, this isn't right. What's not right? And I'm thinking, this is a notebook. That's not right. It's not the words. Ah, <laughs> uh, you see, that that's very akin to my own love of um, nice pens. Oh, nice yeah. pens. You can never have too many nice pens, can oh, you? No. Especially fountain pens. Love my fountain pens. <laughs> um, I have to say, throughout the book, uh, the thing that is uh, most striking, or for me was most striking, is the descriptive language and the imagery that you use because I think it's absolutely brilliantly done um, and even small phrases are so eloquent and bring up such strong images in your mind uh, just to give you a, a couple of examples I think one of my my favorites was when you say mam isn't one who argues she just closes herself like a book and I loved that because I could just clearly see in my mind exactly what you were talking about. Um, and for example, the other one was uh, yesterday was a cold day, cold enough to make my mouth steam like snow in a saucepan. I love that image. It's just a wonderful <laughs> thing. It's straight away. You can see what you mean in your, in your mind. But how easy is it to do that? And is it consciously done or is it something that just happens when you're writing? It's not consciously done anymore. I don't know, maybe at the beginning when I was starting out writing that I was more conscious of it. And and this book was a sort of, you know, I, I wrote it as a as a book for young adults, um, but uh, after deliberation, it was published as an, a novel for adults in Welsh. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting in the different languages it's been published. Some of the countries are publishing it 
as a book novel for adults and some for YA. Mm -hmm. um, but I think when I was starting off writing novels for adults in particular, I was really aware of my own um, style, my own writing style. Mm -hmm. and, and that can be that can be a great hindrance I think yeah. when you're becoming aware I remember a, a really brilliant editor uh, called Alan Jones who the the novel is dedicated to Alan um he once told me um stop trying to write like Manon Stefan Ross um and I didn't I was like well, who, who am I supposed to write like but he was absolutely right it's it's um just to to have the confidence, I suppose, to just write exactly what comes to you at that time. Yeah. More of a sort of stream of consciousness than than analysing it too much. Yeah, I think I, I'm I'm quite obsessive about writing, and because I I, I tend to sort of write in such a, such a short amount of time, and, you know, stay up until three o'clock doing it, and then get up at seven and carry on doing it, um, because it's got sort of all encompassing, and so it comes more naturally in that way for me. I think if I was dipping in and out, I, I don't know if it would work the same way. So um, interesting that you're talking about, you know, the difference between um, obviously writing for adults and writing for younger people. What sort of age group would you think you were targeting this book at? I never think of uh, the reader when I'm writing. I'm writing, you know, I'm, I'm just writing what comes. I'm, I can't say I'm writing for me either, but I'm just writing what comes. And I'm kind of aware that um, there may be people reading this. But uh, I have to say, I read more YA books than books for adults myself. I, I find it a, a really exciting genre. And I feel freer when I'm writing for YA yeah. Um, so I suppose, uh, you know, that's the way, that's what my gut tells me is that it's a YA novel. So um, obviously this is a, a very complex book and there's lots of real places and real events in it. So what research did you have to do for it? <laughs> Too little is the answer, <laughs> to be honest. Um, I, ha I hate doing research. I, I, I didn't really do any, I, I did look a little bit into this, kind of the effects of nuclear radiation and that kind of thing, but I, I cheated, I suppose, by being non-specific about what had actually happened, what the yeah. disaster is. Um, and the rest of it, I, I, I can't remember doing any research at all for this one with some of them you know with some of the other novels if they're historical novels you really have to sort of yeah do a lot of research and it has to be right and it won't feel right if if the facts are wrong but yeah I suppose because I was creating kind of dystopia I was um I had the freedom to create exactly the world I wanted to mm. okay so as we've heard with, from Naomi's amazing pronunciation, and I'm so glad she did it and I didn't have to, um, the book was first published in Welsh. So did you do the translation yourself? I did. Um, yeah, you did? Yeah, yeah. I, I really enjoyed it, actually. Um, so Silver Glass Nepal came out in, I think it was 2018. And uh, because it was a new kind of style of writing for me, it's more stripped back. Mm -hmm. um, than the other things I've written, I tried in the National Eisteddfod um, for the Vettel Rydiaeth, which is a, a prose medal. And yeah. the great thing about the Eisteddfod is that you try under a pseudonym, so no one knows who you are. Um, and so you get kind of, you get an honest opinion yeah. by the the judges who are all kind of respected writers about what they think and I didn't really think that it was going to win because I thought it was I, I thought well I, I don't know if people really want to be reading kind of dystopia I, I consider it a sci-fi novel and I don't I don't know if people want to be reading that kind of thing um and because of that background I I, I felt I feel really close to this novel it's 
I feel close to them all, but this one, I don't know, especially, there's a lot of me in it as well. And so I wanted to do the translation and I felt that I wanted to connect with the novel again as other people were reading it. So I translated the whole thing on my own and I, no one had asked me to translate it and I kind of thought, well, I'm just doing it for me. It, it's never going get, to get published. Um, but the uh, Welsh Literature Exchange took it on as, as one of, of their books for that year and it got me to translate a chapter, um, which was picked up by an agent and then he, it's him that sort of made all of this happen. So the, without the Welsh Literature Exchange, I don't think we'd be sitting here now talking about this. They've been absolutely brilliant. Well, then we're all very grateful to them. Very, very grateful. And to, to the Welsh Books Council, you know, it's it, it's one of the things I think when I talk to people who want to write, um, I think they're always really pleasantly surprised by the the support that's available when you're writing in Welsh or in Wales. Welsh Books Council is just fantastic. I, if ever I'm stressed about anything, I can just pick up the phone and, and they're just wonderful. So when you were doing the translation, are there any differences between the English and the Welsh versions? And did you have to adapt the book in any way to enable the translation? Or is it pretty much verbatim? No, it's it's quite different because um, I didn't want to erase the Welshness of it. Mm -hmm. Because to me, I'd already created these characters and, and they're very real to me. And in my mind, these characters speak Welsh with one another as they did in the original Welsh. So I had to find a reason why would these people who live there, who would have a Welsh speaking background, why would they choose to write this in English? Yeah. And so it became a theme of um, confidence in using uh, the Welsh language and um, finding the Welsh language once again and, and feeling kind of taking possession of it. So that's a whole new theme that's in this um, this version of it. And I, it, it was a really, th that's the thing about adapting your own work because I've adapted other authors' work as well. But with, when I'm adapting, say Enid Blyton books, the most important thing really is that you hear Enid Blyton's voice and not my voice. Mm. But because I'm adapting my own work, I'm I'm completely free to change as I like. And and that was I really enjoyed the process. Okay. Um I, I must admit that it's it's making me upset that I can't read in Welsh. <laughs> I'm sure it is beautiful, um, but I'm afraid that's not going to happen anytime soon, unfortunately. You'll get um, there. You'll get there. Well, maybe, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so how did, um, as you said, uh, you have won awards with this book and also lots and lots of accolades. And, and how did that make you feel? I mean, naturally, I would hope you were proud of it. Yeah, it's really odd. It's a really odd <laughs> feeling um, because writing is is such a solitary um, mm. thing to do and and all of a sudden these characters that you and only you have created and spent time with and 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 you know you believe in them completely now they're out there in the world and I, I know it sounds pretentious but I when people say kind things about the book I, I feel pleased for the characters. They're like, oh, they get you. They understand. That's really nice. I, with me, um, as an author, I feel like I, I need to put a little bit of distance between me and all of that. And so I'm always just kind of concentrating on the next thing and on the next novel. But of course, it's just, you know, it's so lovely to have people enjoy the work that I do. It's surreal. It's and I enjoy my work so much as well. You know, I'm really privileged to be able to do what I do. It's it's always the most fantastic thing you can have in your life to be in a job that isn't work. <laughs> that exactly, exactly. I yeah. count my blessings every day that I'm doing what I do. It, it's interesting what you said, Manon, about, you know, you weren't sure that people would want to read that type of book at the moment, but 
when you think about it, we've been living in a dystopian book for the last two years, haven't we? So yeah. um, it doesn't seem that dystopian at all in some ways because we've got a bit used to it. So when it comes to um, the underpinning messages that you would like young people to take from the book, is there anything that comes to mind or was is it just, as you said, it's a way of you exploring things and you don't think about what the effect it's going to have on the young people? I have absolutely no intent <laughs> of anyone taking anything away except what they feel at the end of the book um if i if i wrote a story trying to make some kind of point or trying to make someone feel something specific i'd i, I think i i'd get bogged down in that yeah. um it's a story and one of the interesting things about um writing i think creating generally is i write a book but i am about 75 percent responsible for what you read when you read that book. Um, I've created these characters, but the film in your head of what is happening in this book will be completely different to mine, will be completely different to Naomi's or Penny's. It's, you know, you it's, it's a mirror. It's a reflection of, of you when you read a book. And I think once, once you clock that, you realise, well, you have very little control once something is published. Um, and thank goodness for that. That's exactly what it's supposed to be. Yeah, I, I always feel as a, naturally not being an author, but I've always wondered whether authors do get upset when their characters are misunderstood by the readers, you know, because you're quite right. We all see things differently and we all read different things into it. Um, and as the creator of that, it must sometimes be a little bit galling. to say, no, that's just not <laughs> it. No. <laughs> that's the one thing is that I'm... I, I try not to, to read reviews, but of course I read them all vividly several <laughs> times over. Um, but the one thing that really gets to me is if someone said they don't like a character that I wanted them yeah. to empathise with. Mm. I feel like I've let that character down in a way. I think that's that's the best way I can describe it. If someone doesn't like a book, that's that's okay. I have to accept it. I have to... I, there's no point in me, you know, getting irate or even upset about that because, you know, I was I was saying earlier, this is a really lovely job that I've got and it's my responsibility to make a book enjoyable. Mm -hmm. It's not your responsibility. It's not your responsibility as a reader to enjoy a book. <laughs> yeah. yeah. This is true. This is true. I mean, I find um, I was reading an interview you did previously as well about the and it's really hard having this conversation without giving spoilers isn't it um but the way that the neighbors in the book have been perceived by some people mm. is completely different to the way you felt about them and and I found that really really interesting um because as you said in the previous interview lots of people have disliked those those characters and yet you really love them yeah yeah I do I, I feel that those characters save our main characters yeah that they kind of save our world um in in that way so it's really interesting that some people don't like them um but also I think there's a kind of uh, the people who are uh who are watching who have read the book will probably understand what I'm saying but I think there's a kind of a, a broader political um yeah. context to that as well um, yeah. which which I, I can remember when I was writing it thinking oh it's interesting that I'm doing this in this way what am I you know thinking about my own um about the fact that I, I love them. I love those two very much. I, I do. I, th I think they're great characters. You know, I, I was really surprised when I read that. <laughs> you know, I thought, oh, perhaps, perhaps I'm not reading it in the same way as other people. Which... Well, no, 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 no one will read it in the same no, way. Thank no, goodness. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I also, I really enjoyed the way that your, um, one of your main characters and his sister became um, so fond of the wild hair 
and um and I found that really, really touching. Um, and it also made the the its eventual demise even more shocking. Mm. I was, yeah, I was nearly in tears at that bit. I've got to say, I was like, <laughs> no. Um, but was there a, anything within that where you were using it perhaps as a, a comment on the way that we are attracted to perfection so much in society? Again, it's I know this is an annoying answer. But I don't. I didn't plan it. It kind of happened, and I didn't know about its demise when I was writing it. I wasn't kind of thinking about, oh, where is this going to lead? It just sort of happened. I think the thing with publishing is, you publish and then you witness other people's conversations about your work, and you kind of go, oh yeah, yeah, maybe that's what I was doing. But actually, I'm not that clever. I mean, the reader is quite often clever. <laughs> Other than me, and they can find stuff that I didn't intend to put in there, but subconsciously, who knows? I think that's um, something that comes up quite frequently because I've had a um, conversation with authors before, and they've said the thing that they think would kill their novel dead is if a school started studying it. Well, in, in, <laughs> this is studied for GCSE Welsh now. And I'm just thinking about the kind of generations of kids that are going to hate me forever. But yeah, it's, oh, it's, <laughs> it's, it's just such a, an odd feeling to kind of be, have your work studied in that way. Yeah. Um, but actually get such a privilege again, you know, that, you know, people, a lot, a lot of people are reading the book and, and I, I can't, I can't quite get my head around it, that whole thing. <laughs> but that's a it's a big thing it's a big thing yeah. to have your your book being studied for for exams that is huge huge it, it's I, I remember the books that I used to read in, at school you know I was just thinking oh yeah you know it's quite weird is that it's in that kind of slot <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah but I suppose when we were reading those books at school we weren't perhaps of an age to appreciate them as much as we should have done well, a lot of those books really, really shaped me, not just as a writer, but as a person. So it's a really huge honour to kind mm. of be given the opportunity to take space inside people's heads. I think that's the that's the biggest thing for me is that when I start thinking about this, I can't write, so I have to not think about it too much. But when I think that people are giving not only their time to read a book, but giving their whole attention and giving their mind, so they're creating something in their mind from what I have written down in a book. And to me, that's such an honour mm. that it's almost too too big for me to be able to comprehend and I, I, I sort of have to just think right it's just a story and go on we're just <laughs> just moving getting on. words up yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay well time is absolutely flying by and I have got another couple of questions for you but in the meantime um if anyone in the audience wants to um put a question please do put it into the chat box now and then I can read them out to Manon afterwards so um something I did want to pull out there is um a fantastic quote in the book from a poem by Alid Lewis Evans of Forgive Us Our Apathy, which is incredibly powerful. Um, and what did you intend it to mean within the context of the story? I think that's probably... Um, that, that poem, it's called Dukwedi Dros Hin, A Prayer for These Things, and it's... It's a really long, such a wonderful poem. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that the reason I find it so powerful is that it, it, I see myself reflected in it. I, I, I feel that I am apathetic about a lot of things. I think our society generally, we're apathetic about a lot of things that we we should care a great deal more about. And I think that's part of this novel is, well, a, a big part of it is what do we care about? You know, who do we care for? Um, what's, what's important, I suppose. It is, but it's also a bit of a, it's a coming of age novel as well, isn't it? I mean, it, main character has to grow up very quickly. Yeah, but also he can't get away. 
because no. there's no one else. And it's about that need for people as well. You know, I'm I'm a, a really, I'm a loner, you know. I haven't struggled at all with isolation because I self-isolate by nature. But we also, we, we really need other human beings. And I wanted to maybe explore that a little bit and mm. wonder sort of what would it be like if we didn't have the choice. Yeah, mm. yeah, because... He's not got the choice to pull away from his mother Mm. because they're in the same house and there's nobody else there, which does bring up some really interesting situations. Let me put it that way. Um, You were saying that for you, it's always on to the next thing. So naturally, my last question is going to be, what is the next thing? What are you working on at the moment? Well, I'm almost done with a novel for uh, Lolva um, about uh, Welsh connections to the slave trade. Mm-hmm. Um, it's something I've been scared of writing for a very long time, and I decided I had to do it. But then afterwards, I've uh, I, I I had this idea when I was on a mountain in the summer, and that will be a kind of stripped back monster sci-fi thing I'm not sure what it's going to be yet but that's <laughs> that's something I'm really excited about starting that sounds really interesting <laughs> <laughs> yeah I'd read that I'd definitely read oh, good that. good good <laughs> okay let me just um I'll just open the chat box up and see if we've got any questions in here oh yes it looks like we've got lots of questions going on that's wonderful um right i'm going to go for the most recent first um this is from hannah who's saying she wanted to ask you about the ending whilst trying not to give too much away naturally um and she says it poses so many questions about what happens next but it seems so relevant for the current experience and discussions around returning to normal Mm -hmm. and she says was this intentional or just a happy accident and i couldn't couldn't agree more Hannah about the ending yeah the ending is a really interesting one because different readers react differently towards it so some people think it's a happy ending and some people think it's tragic um this book was published in Welsh in 2018 so it was Mm pre-covid and that's a an odd experience to be going through all this now and and these last two years and a lot of people have said oh gosh this reminds me of uh, Phil Glass Nepo um but yeah with the ending I'm 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 still not sure which side I'm on if I think I'm still not sure what happens actually um well it's left so open-ended isn't it um it's in my opinion it's a hopeful ending but there's also a real sense of foreboding there as well I think if I if I'd written this book post pandemic the ending would be different I think well or I'd feel differently about the ending because you know that feeling at the beginning of the pandemic when we were all out clapping and and you know the community came together and that fell apart really quickly didn't it and Mm -hmm. I I think I'd be less hopeful now to be honest interestingly yeah. Okay, I'm going to swiftly move on there. <laughs> we don't want to think about that. Um, so Ellen, Ellen's asking, she wanted to ask about the title because she knows you've already referenced medieval history as an inspiration, but she wondered if the 19th century blue books were also being referenced. And if so, what connection is being suggested? Ah, oh, that's a brilliant question. Um, to be completely honest with you, it's a get, once again, it's one of those things that I didn't even think about until way after the book was published. I didn't think of the connection with um, um, the treachery of the blue books. But then again, I suppose there is a subconscious element of those are the blue books that we know and we're familiar with in Wales. So, so maybe... So I'm, I'm sorry, that's not a very um, fulfilling answer. But no, that's fine. That's fine. Truth. Um, it was quite possibly, as you say, it's come from your sub- subconscious because it's something that was there. 
I always say subconscious when I actually mean, no, I'm not that clever. You're cleverer than me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, ju- I'll just, you know. I'll I don't that. believe that. <laughs> I don't believe that at all. Um, oh, so many lovely comments in here. Oh, so you. many. You, you definitely want to read this after. Oh, thank you. You definitely want to read it, although it may make you a little bit shy because they're all brilliant. Oh. <laughs> um, let me see. Oh. Oh, that's a fantastic comment. Um, Val is just saying that it's such a beautiful novel and every word is really used with purpose. It's a masterclass in powerful simplicity. Also so interesting to hear about Manon's mum. And she says she'd love to read that book. So there you go. She's going to go back to that one. Thank you, Val. Um, Okay. I don't think there's, no, there's none at the top. Let's come down to the bottom because I see there's three new messages in there. I'm glad you're doing this tech side. (laughs) Yeah, that's my thing. (laughs) That's my thing. (laughs) So, um, okay. Nicola is saying that the book is bringing to mind Peter Dickinson's The Devil's Children, which was written in 1972 and made into a TV series for children. And the TV series scared us silly. (laughs) And that actually has great relevance with a question a little bit further up from Sarah, who's saying, is there any chance of a TV series or a film? Because even though the book is so booky, which I totally see what she means, and it's all about the love of books and, and how we use them through our lives. But she says it's also very cinematic, and she'd devour a filmed version too. So is there any? are there any plans for that? Well, yes, short answer, uh, yes. There are, um, I've, I've sold the option um, to this novel, uh, but it's, it's a really long process and trying to get funding and that kind of thing. Who knows what's going to happen? But, yeah, I'm crossing everything because I, I do think I can see the film in my head quite clearly. There was a, a theatre, um, um, the stage play production of Flip Glass Nepal as well, so I think that helps with me kind of plotting it out and seeing it in my mind. But hopefully cross everything for me. That would be brilliant. Well, I'm going to ask a really horrible question now. Oh, gosh. If you had to cho- had your pick of any actress to play mum, oh. who would you choose? Um, I'm, I'm going to choose the same actress who was in the stage play, and um, she's an actress called Tara Bethan, mm-hmm. and she just nailed it. And what was really odd about that, that stage version is that... Um, I would go in to the rehearsals and I'd feel really uncomfortable with her. Um, she was playing Rowena and I'd, I, you know, I was trying my very best to be sociable, but I couldn't look at her. And after a while, it, I kind of realised I have to be nicer to Tara. And Tara wasn't really looking at me either. Um, but I kind of realised oh, she's, she's acting me. I wasn't comfortable with how similar I am to Rowena and seeing her made me face that. And I think she felt exactly the same. She was so, so, so good as Rowena. So, yeah, Tara's the one. Wow, that's that's a huge compliment to her acting. (laughs) Yeah, that's amazing. Um, And Helgard is asking, could you ever imagine writing in English first with a book? Yes. And this is something I've been thinking about a lot recently. There's a novel in my head. I wrote half a novel um, in English about eight years ago, and I just kind of thought, oh, I just fed up of it and put it to one side. And then I kind of gone back to it recently and thought, oh, that's, that's all right. But yes, I'd like to to have a go at doing that. Um, Maybe one of the next. I'm, I'm not sure when that will be, but yeah, I, I, I would really. It's like playing with a new toy. I hadn't yeah. written in English for so long, but I really, I'm really lucky to have two languages to play with, and that they're both so different. You know, the the mm. characteristics of the languages are so different, and they're just both just so full of joy for me as an author. Really enjoy them both. Okay, um, Naomi has asked, did you enjoy reading as a child? 
um, and you did mention earlier that you did, but what sort of books or authors did you enjoy most when you were younger? Oh, I loved reading, absolutely loved it and still do. Um, I really loved uh, books by Judy Bloom and Paula Danziger, these kind of American sisterhood sort of people with lives so completely different to mine. Um, but also in Welsh, I would read Gareth F. Williams books. Um, but I have to say that the one book, I go back to this book every single year, and I think I've read it every year for at least 30 years now, is um, Boy by Ryl Dahl. Mm. Um, I just, there's something about that book because it's just, I just love it. I just love it. I think it's got everything. It's got such humour and warmth and it feels, it fe it's, it's so much more than the words that are in, that are on the pages. I love it. It, it is. It's a fantastic book. But who are your... Who are your writing heroes now? Oh, there's so many. The obvious one for me, um, and someone who was a kind of direct influence, I think, on on the Blue Book of Nepo was John Wyndham. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. I love sci-fi, but I didn't I didn't use to quite recently got into sci-fi and I would read sci-fi novels and they would be very plot heavy and I'd enjoy them. I'd quite enjoy the trashy 1970s ones. And, but with John Wyndham, he, he's, he writes character-led sci-fi mm. and that's what makes it work, that you believe completely in the world that he's created because of the reaction of the characters. I, I just think he's a wonderful, wonderful writer. A little bit of fangirling there, I can oh, see. Oh, totally, totally. <laughs> and there are loads of Welsh writers. One of the lovely things about um, seeing the, the book published in, in English and in different languages is seeing a quote that I've put from a, a Welsh poet called T.H. Parry Williams at the end and seeing it translated into all these different um, languages because... Mm. His work is just something. Like, I'm not going to even start with the fangirling of T.H. Paddy Williams because I'll be pathetic. But if you know, you know. Okay. <laughs> so when you're reading, because you say you still love reading now, mm -hmm. do you read any particular genre or do you like a wide reading diet? If I'm in the middle of writing a novel, if I'm really in the zone, I tend not to write, read fiction. Mm -hmm. So I read a lot of fiction between writing books, but I, I like um, factual books and quite odd books quite often. I've, I've really enjoyed um, Carlo Rovelli's books about physics, especially um, sort of quantum time um, books. And yeah, it's that kind of thing. I'll, I'll just pick things up um, that are quite quite random stuff really and then I'll obsess about I'm quite obsessive with stuff you know I'll get obsessed with something and then I'll know everything about it and I'll watch everything about it on YouTube and I'll read everything about it and then I'll move on to the next thing. Man and all through this you've been saying I'm not very clever and you're now telling me that you're reading books on quantum physics. Oh no honestly Carlo Rovelli is um, someone called him uh, the poet of the physics world and that's why it's really kind of wow. accessible because honestly with science stuff when I was at school that my physics teacher would laugh if he knew that I was reading quantum physics but they're not but they're so readable and understandable um yeah Great. yeah I was a bit the same science at school I was the mm. only person that managed to um melt the rubber in the end of the test tube but never mind <laughs> it's fine it's fine um okay a couple of last quick questions Val's asking do your children read your books no no my children don't really read fiction at all unless they're forced to although um that first book I was telling you about the one uh, that I wrote about my mother in order to kind of introduce my mum to my kids uh, that was the first book that my eldest read um, in his Welsh classroom at school so they read it as a class um, so that was 
really interesting. And my youngest now, he's just started uh, secondary school and they've read a, a book of mine in class. And I, I kind of, I say to them, is it a bit embarrassing that, you know, the whole <laughs> class has got to read books by your mum? And I remember the eldest saying, no, it's not embarrassing, but it's just that everybody thinks we're minted. <laughs> Well, of course. <laughs> and uh, lastly, uh, Imogen has asked, um, do you write differently in different languages? And are the stories or the characters different in any way when you're writing in different languages? Yeah, that's a very good question, because I, I, I do think it is a phenomenon that, you know, you are a different person in each different language that you speak. Mm -hmm. um, and... I translated a, a novel a couple of years ago in Welsh, it was Blasi, and in English it was season, The Seasoning. And I, I translated that kind of more or less word for word, um, but they're completely different novels. The characters are completely different, and, and I, I didn't change anything. So I think I, things tend to feel a little bit darker in Welsh. Mm -hmm. um, but... Also, it's really maybe I'm the the last person who who should answer that question really because I can never quite tell the differences. I think maybe because I have experience of both. Yeah, yeah. Maybe I'm not the one to answer that question. Okay, that's fair <laughs> enough. That's fair enough. They both come from yourself, so um, I can see that would be quite difficult to see any difference. Okay, well. I think we are literally a couple of minutes out of time. So um, I'm going to pass back to Naomi now to, to finish the evening off. But can I just say from myself, thank you so much, man. And that was such a lovely chat. Oh, thank um, you, Bev. And your and cats behaved. <laughs> they did. They and did. my children oh, behaved too. <laughs> yes. yes, this is true. <laughs> okay, I'll just pass back to Naomi for now. Thank you. Thanks. Well, I, I've not. How do I follow that? I mean, that was just fascinating. I could have sat here for another another half hour listening to you talk, um, but it's been a fabulous evening. So thank you so much, Manon. Um, and now, if I can just ask everyone to, if they've got a glass or a, a drink of any kind, I think we should raise our glasses and say congratulations to you. <laughs> congratulations, Manon. Oh, thank you ever so much. And thank you all for coming. I'm really touched that so many people came. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for coming, everybody.